morning. How's everybody doing? I'm glad to be here on this beautiful and glorious day. We are so grateful to all that God has been doing and is doing in this place, just keeping us alive and in God's presence. You ought to celebrate that every time you get. You, you ought to get to the point in your journey where it doesn't have to be anything in particular that you celebrate God for. When you just think about the fact that you are alive and breathing and here, that is something worthy, worthy, and we thank God for that. We are truly grateful. Let me say before I say anything else, make sure, make sure that on Tuesday you get out to vote. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. It ought not be some kind of cultural or political crisis that motivates you to vote. You ought to be intentional every opportunity you get. Midterms, presidential, state, local. You ought to be invested in the future of your community and who we are called to be. That's why it's important. There are a lot of important races going on around the country right now. But for this state and for this season and for your life, you ought to make sure that you are engaged. And so you encourage people you know to make sure uh, to get out and vote on Tuesday. I don't know what the weather is going to be, but it don't matter what the weather is going to be like. There are a whole lot of things we go to when the weather is bad. I've seen folk wait in line for the club in the rain and the snow. And so, you know, you can get online to go vote on Tuesday if need be. It is that critical and that important. Hey, man, it is good to be here in this place and, and just here, period. And so, and so for that, we are grateful. Uh, next week is Visionary and Dreamer Sunday. It is supposed to be in September, but I had little issues uh, in September. But celebrating next Sunday, 14 years. I've been here at FCBC, and so... I, I am excited about that. I'm excited about every year, but I'm excited for being here. Well, before we get started, uh, let's together declare our purpose statement. Also, yes, well, that's a good announcement to have up, although not the first Sunday. Okay. Why right, y'all put that up there for me to see? Let's declare our purpose statement together. For those of you who are visiting with us, uh, oh, y'all having an issue with the purpose statement up on the screen. Well, it don't matter. We should know it anyway. And, and, and if you don't know it, this is, you know, everything is providential when it happens. And there's some folk I know who don't know it. I'm going to give you a pass. You visiting. So what you do is, while the people around you saying it, just act like you engage. <laughs> Nod. If you feel like just mouthing some things, you can do that. But you should be surrounded by enough people that they can cover for you in this moment. Amen? Amen? Come on, FCBC. We are an ever-evolving community of visionaries, dreamers, and doers who have been called by God to... Commanded by God to... And commissioned. Boy, y'all did all right. Give yourselves a hand for that. Amen. Now, between service, make sure y'all find that. I ain't too confident in 11 a.m. service, so make sure y'all get that together. Amen? Call to live the life we are created to live. My God, live the life you were created to live. That God has made a divine investment in your life. And if God has made a divine investment in your life, then you are obligated to live your life. Not someone else's life. You don't get credit for being a copycat. You got to be who God has called you to be. Amen. Commanded to love, love, love beyond the limits of our prejudices. We have been seeing and been hearing and been witnessing too many instances of hate in this country. Too many people damaged by hate, wounded by hate, and even killed by hate. And in a time like this, we need people who are love warriors. And, and I tell folks that we can talk every day about the division in this country. We can talk every day about the hate in this country. But at some point, we have to become transcendent visionaries and cast a vision for how we can reconcile ourselves and mend the breach and heal the brokenness. And who's going to do that? Love warriors. And I believe that is who God has called us to be. And finally, commission to serve. 
I know they may have said it the other day, but on our clothing wall, we gave out 50,000 pounds of clothing. Over 2,000 people were blessed. That is amazing. And that's because of your contributions. But we do all kinds of things. And so if you're an early bird and you like getting up early and getting your coffee or reading your devotional, make your devotional. Come down here and volunteer for breakfast before books in the morning. Amen? Where, where we serve our young people breakfast. It won't take a whole lot of time, but we are committed to serve because we don't believe that our individual responsibility is to enter any room and suck all the oxygen out of the room. We're called to serve one another. Amen? So we're called to live, commanded to love, and commissioned to serve. And if you cannot remember all of that, what do we say, family? Live, Y'all remember that too. Man, y'all good, man. Live, love, and serve. Excellent. Um, today is the first time in a long time that I'm going to do both of these services today. And so I'm excited. I'm excited about that. And I want us... Um, oh, this is gonna be this is a, a tough one, I think, a little bit. You said, "Come on with it." <laughs> All right. First Samuel sixteen, sixteen and one. Last time I preached it was First Samuel sixteen six and seven. I'm gonna do First Samuel sixteen verse one. Uh, to all our visitors, we are so happy. We have a good time here, as you can see. We, I believe, in worshiping and laughing and enjoying yourself in God's presence. You should experience every emotion in the presence of God that you've been gifted with as a human being. Don't deny yourself of your emotion. If you gotta cry, cry. You wanna laugh, laugh. You wanna shout, shout, scream, get it all out. The worst thing you can do is hold in stuff and then it starts eating you alive on the inside. We've been given these wonderful emotions. I want to share today a word with those of us, uh, this may hit for some, those of us who have a problem leaving spaces we should have left a long time ago. First Samuel 16 and 1. I don't want to read these words. See on the screen here. First Samuel 16 and 1. In our SV version, here's what the Lord said to the prophet Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? seeing I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and go. Let's pray. I'll stop right there. I know there's more to verse one, but I'm going to stop right there. All right, and I'll read the next when we read it again. Let's pray. God, we thank you today. We are so humbled and honored just to be together to be in this place, to be in your presence, to share in this moment with one another. We cannot and will not take these moments for granted, moments of fellowship and faith, moments that challenge us and grow us, moments, oh God, that push us to be our better and best selves that we can be, not for anyone else, oh God, but for you and you alone because no one else can love us the way you do. No one else can hold us the way you do. No one else can keep us the way you do. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for giving us a reason for getting up every morning, for reminding us that there's meaning in our breathing. We love you, Lord. Now, oh God, do whatever you need to do in this moment to get the glory. Do whatever you need to do in this moment, oh God, so that we might open our hearts and our minds and our ears to be receptive to your word. We love you. And we honor you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Good, remain standing. Let me read. I'm going to read the whole verse 1 in its entirety. 1 Samuel 16 and 1, and it says, The Lord said to Samuel, How long? Somebody say, how long? How long will you grieve over Saul, seeing I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. Come on, turn the page. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. 
This is that word by part again. How long will you grieve over Saul? Amen? Amen. Put your hands together and give the Lord a hand kind of praise as you take your seat. This morning, I want to talk about learning how to leave left places. Learning how to leave left places. Grief was building momentum in Samuel's spirit. Profound sadness had a hold on him. His heart was heavy. His countenance was weary. Because in some ways he could still hear the remnants of the tearing of his garment. That sound of the tearing of Samuel's garment simultaneously meant the rupturing of Saul, the king's leadership. It was in that profound scene in 15 Samuel where, where Saul had already overstepped his boundaries as king. And if you know Saul's tragic story, he, he was preparing for war with the Philistines and Samuel told Saul that I'll be here in seven days to offer up a sacrifice because Israel could not go into battle without a sacrifice by the priest. And so Samuel told Saul that I'll be here in seven days and I'll offer sacrifice and then we can go to war. But during that seven days, Saul saw the Philistine armies mounting. He saw their soldiers building up their forces, preparing for battle. He saw his own people running and fleeing. These were God's people who had seen God do great things. And yet in the face of a ferocious foe, they were running and leaving and hiding. The scripture says that Israel, the people were hiding under rocks and in cisterns. That some had even crossed over the Jordan heading east back to the places that God had delivered them from long ago. And when Saul saw the people leaving and the enemy mounting and the pressure building, instead of waiting for Samuel, Saul decided that since he was king, it gave him permissive freedom to make the sacrifice himself. And so Saul makes the sacrifice that only the priest was supposed to make. And just as he finished making the sacrifice, the scripture says that Samuel showed up on the scene. And when Samuel showed up on the scene, he asked Saul, what have you done? And there, right there, God let the priest Samuel know where his mind was. Let, let let Samuel, rather, let Saul know that, that I'm no longer with him. Because he let fear take precedence over obedience. Let Saul know that I'm no longer with him. My spirit has left him. And I have rejected him. Then even after the Philistine battle, the record says that the Amalekites were the next army that they had to face Israel. And, and God gave Saul maybe not another chance, but he gave him more directives. Destroy everything of the Amalekites. Destroy the king. Destroy the people. Destroy all their possessions. Destroy it. And even after hearing that God was angry with his disobedience, he disobeys again. He kills the Amalekites, but he lets Agag, the king, live. And then he keeps the best of the sheep and the cattle for himself. When prophet Samuel enters the scene again, expecting that all the Amalekites have been erased, that everything they had was destroyed, when he enters the compound of Israel, Samuel says to Saul again, what have you done? Saul says to Samuel, what do you mean I've done everything that God told me to do? And then there's this line, it's quirky, but it's powerful in scripture. Samuel says to Saul, why is it then if you've done everything that God has told you to do with regard to the Amalekites and destroying everything, why do I hear the bleeding of sheep and the mooing of cattle? 
And then God reinforces it. God has rejected you. God would have allowed your reign and your family to reign forever. And Samuel turned and walked away after making that grand and painful pronouncement. And when he turned to walk away, the scripture says that Saul grabbed his garment and Samuel kept on moving. When he held on to the ga garment, it tore. And then Samuel turned and looked at Saul who was now broken because he knew something had shifted in the relationship with he and God. When he had turned to look at Saul, he says, just as you tore my garment, God has torn the kingdom from your hands. And your reign will end soon. The deep thing is that Saul was still the king. God did not strip him of his title yet, but he did take away his presence. He had position and power, but no divine presence. And on top of that, God had rejected him. And when Samuel began to think about that, his heart was heavy, his soul was sad, his spirit was deflated because Samuel had grown to love Saul. It's amazing. I, I think about Samuel and Saul, and if you get a chance, read their relationship. They were quite close, probably in part because of the similarity of their names. Saul, Samuel. Saul and Samuel. Samuel means acts of God. Saul means axed for. These were two men who were axed to be there. Saul was axed by the people to be king. And Samuel was axed by his mother to God to have a child. Two axed for men who grew a bond together. But the bond was ruptured now, not because of dysfunction in their relationship, not because there was a problem with their uh, friendship, but because God said, leave Saul. And In that first verse of chapter 16 of the book of 1 Samuel, it is as if God senses Samuel's grief, but God is not even moved by the grief or the mourning or the sadness. He does not come in to coddle Samuel or make Samuel feel better about the moment. He asks him a pointed question that almost seemed cold and a little callous. How long will you grieve over Saul? How long will you grieve over Saul? How long will you linger in that space? I have left him. I have rejected him. How long will you linger in a left place? How long will you stay there when I'm no longer there? How long will you mourn what I've already rejected? How long will you hold on to what I don't want for you? How long will you live and linger in a left place? Remember, it wasn't that something was wrong with Saul or Samuel or that Samuel and Saul had some issue. It was that God was telling him it's time to move on. Stop crying over spilled milk. And leave. Why? Because not only have I rejected Saul, I've already found somebody else. Someone after my own heart. Can you imagine? Saul was what they wanted. David is who I want. Get your horn ready. Fill it with oil. Make your way down to Bethlehem and let go of the temptation to linger and stay in left places. How many of us have found ourselves Lingering in left places. Hanging out in rejected spaces. It is not that God necessarily finds something wrong with it. God just don't want it for you. 
And I know when you hear that word from God to leave those spaces and places that have brought you so much joy and peace at times, it is hard to receive a word to leave a place. But God is not asking you to leave it for the sake of leaving it. God is saying leave it because it's already left. Leave it because I've already rejected it. And yet we still stay. Oh, my God. I know there are more than a few of us in here who bear the emotional marks of lingering too long in left places. There are a whole lot of us in here today who bear the burden and carry the weariness of staying too long in places that are not just bad for you, but God no longer wants you there in. I have rejected that place. I have left that place. And yet some of us are determined to stay in that place. Well, I'll give you one reason, and I'll give you a couple other things, and I'll get out of here. Let me tell you why I think we linger in left places first. You see, when I look at the prophet Samuel, Samuel had a track record and a history of coming into certain situations that Israel had messed up and fixing it. When the Ark of the Covenant was captured and Israel had lost their way because the Ark was captured and then when the Ark was returned and Israel did not understand how to treat the Ark or even deal with their enemies, it was Samuel who came in and fixed everything. He got rid of the people who refused to worship in the presence of God and dealt even with the enemies of Israel. He fixed it. Even here in this story I told you, when, when, when Saul refused to destroy the Amalekites entirely and destroy the best of their cattle and even kill the king Agag, when Samuel confronted Saul and they had captured Agag, they just did not kill him, Samuel told Saul, bring Agag to me. If you read that scripture, Samuel drew his sword and cut Agag to pieces. He fixed the situation. The reason why some of us linger and left places is because we think we were called to be fixers. And something in your spirit tells you that you can't leave right now because you're obligated to fix it. You have a fixer spirit. And you feel like you've been called to, to remedy the situation and rectify it. In fact, some of us entered the space thinking we were a fixer from the beginning. And we thought that somehow we could not only fix it, but here's a real kicker, we could shape it to meet what we needed. And so we thought because we could fix it, then we could stay there and get it right. And so we won't leave it because we want to fix it. We won't leave him because we want to fix him. We won't leave her because we want to fix her. We won't leave the situation because we're going to fix it. Because we think we were called to be fixers. We forgot our identity. Because we wanted to rectify it. Oh, I know this might be painful for some of us in here today who, who've been lingering and left places that... That, that God's presence has left for you in that space a long time ago. And I know it's hard to hear it because God, in some ways, has been looking at you and been holding you accountable and, and been looking to you to fix some things in the past. But this thing, he didn't say fix, he said leave. And so it becomes hard, does it not? Because you want to fix it. And the fixer in you never gives up on your fixing skills. No matter how bad it looks, the fixer in you says, I can turn it around. No matter how grim it looks, the fixer in you says, but I can get it right. Something in you, 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 you start thinking, you try to spiritualize your fixing mentality and you start praying and fasting and, and holding all kind of vigils around the situation because you believe, you start quoting scripture, Lord, you said if I turn from my evil ways and I call on you that you would heal this space and I need you, God, to heal it because I, I believe it's what you want from me. Pause, hold on. I believe it's what you want from me. Now, here's a deep thing. God has sent you sign on top of sign that this is no longer the place. I want you to here. Not it wasn't the place, it's no longer the place. It was at one point, but now it is time to move on from where you are and shed your fixing mentality. Yeah. 
In this season of your life, your assignment is not about fixing. Oh my God, it's about living. And then you got to ask yourself, how much life have you missed because you've been busy being a fixer and not a liver? Oh God, you stopped living because you were fixing. You stopped living because you were trying to get it right. You stopped living and put all your chips into one basket. You put all of your energy into this space that you wanted to fix because my God, and here's the deep thing for fixers. Fixers uh, begin to internalize a situation and you think if you can't fix it, it's a statement about you. Oh, that's why you don't walk away from it, because it's not just the situation that you think is on the line. It's your reputation and your image you want to protect. And you start thinking if it don't get right, then it's all about you. That means you've made the situation that wasn't about you all about you because you got to be able to fix it. And what you fail to realize, watch this, and I know you don't want to hear this. It's going to be hard work coming from preaching this morning. There are some spaces you were not called to fix because your gifts won't fix this thing. going to fix somebody who don't want to be helped? How are you going to fix a space that don't even see the problem? No. That's why we have a hard time leaving the left place because we feel we've been called to fix it. The deep part is that we feel we need to fix it because we see that it's broken. And then our ego says we have the skills to put it back together. Even if putting it back together is not our assignment. So now that we got a better understanding why some of us don't leave the left place, why should we leave the left place? Here, here, two simple things and I'll be done. Some of us need to leave the left place because lingering in the left place has caused you to miss moments with God. How many moments have you missed that could have transformed your life because you were busy lingering and fixing the left place? How many things pass you by that you somehow spiritualize you're missing because of what you thought was your appointed assignment? Oh, that ain't it yet? Okay. How much joy have you missed? How much peace have you forfeited? How much happiness have you sacrificed? How many smiles have you buried because you stayed in the left place? What did you miss? It wasn't a necessary sacrifice because it wasn't required from God. You created the necessity because you are a fixer. And you felt you had to stay. And in the process of staying, the dynamic God you follow was moving and things were happening all around you. And you were missing those moments because you were lingering in the left place. So you have to leave the left place no matter how painful it is because you can't keep on missing transformative moments in your life. You can't keep on missing opportunities that can transform you, encounters that can enhance you, people who will help you grow, who will pour into you. And here's a deep thing. You've been lingering so long in the left place, you forgot what it felt like to be poured into. Because you've been using all your energy trying to pour into a left place and to make a rejected space work. So you even miss your own growing moments and you're trying to figure out why now growth has been stunted. Spirituality seems to be vanquishing. The joy you had is no longer there. You're angry all the time but don't want to admit it. Frustrated most of the time but can't face it. Don't want to move forward even though you want to move forward but you're lingering in the left place because the left place makes you feel good about who you are based on the abilities you think you have but missing the moments with God that he requires for you. It's painful, but it's more painful to keep missing moments. It's more painful to keep missing opportunities of growth and breakthrough and transformation. It's more painful to keep missing moments of joy and happiness and peace. It's, it's more painful to keep missing moments of calm. You ought to want yourself to just be good. 
Here's the other thing, and I'm done, and I'll let you go. <laughs> you have to leave the left place because the current assignment requires it. See, God has given you a new assignment. And you haven't gravitated towards the new assignment because you're lingering in the left place. You thought the old assignment was perpetual. Oh, God. Y'all didn't get that part. You thought the old assignment and space you were in was permanent. Oh, you see that, that? Let me tell you how you know it hurt when nobody say nothing. <laughs> I thought I was supposed to be here forever, forever, ever. <laughs> Samuel, Samuel thought that relationship would be in perpetuity. And God is saying, here's the deal. You have to leave because you are the one I've appointed for this next assignment in your life. You see, his assignment was to do what? God told him. And here's a deep thing. And here's a deep thing. We think that sometimes God is just like, like me. Tell the truth. Don't lie. Don't make sense lying in church. A whole lot of us who've been trying to, we, we feel like God is just messed up sometimes. That God is just mean sometimes. And when you feel that in your heart and somebody asks you, how you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored the Lord. God is... God is good. And, and, and listen, listen, you, because if it's already here, you might as well verbalize it, right? Because it, God made it clear in this same chapter, I search heart. I don't look at faces. And so if that anger is in your heart, let it out for it eats you up. And let me tell you, God is big enough to handle your current frustrations. God is big enough to handle your anger that you ain't really going to do nothing to God because you're mad at God at the moment. God has seen you go through this place before when you were mad and happy with God, mad and happy with God, mad and happy. I'm sad but blessed. I'm hurt hurting but delivered. I mean, God has seen this before, and so this is nothing new for God. So you might as well be honest about it. And, and here's the thing that makes God seem cold sometimes. God don't even pay attention to your grieving. God didn't come and tell me, look, man, just pick your head up, Samuel. Get things together. Dust your shoulder off, man. I can work for you. He said, how long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him. Go ahead and get your uh, ram's horn, fill it with oil, and go down to Bethlehem. You can go down there crying, I don't care. Go down there sad, I don't care. Go down there with a heavy heart, I don't care. But you're going to go where I'm sending you to go. You, you, look. Look, let me be make it clear. When you're being obedient to God, be true to your feelings. God, I don't want to go. I don't even feel like doing this right now. I don't even understand why you call me, but I'm still going because why? Obedience is better than sacrifice. And so, and so I'll keep going. I got work for you to do. There's still more work to be done. Don't let your grief get you stuck. Don't let your mourning get you stuck. I have work for you to do. I need somebody who's an extension of me to go and anoint this dirty little smelly boy in his daddy's backyard because that's who I favor right now. And I need you to go and get it done. If I wanted somebody else to do it, I would have got them. But I know what you're going through right now. I know how much you've been hurting. And I know how much you've been crying. And I know what you've been going through. But I need you right now. Now, in this season. Because I have an assignment for you. Don't you know? That lingering over every shed tear of the left place is the foreshadowing of your next assignment sitting next to you in your place of mourning is the nudging of your next place. That's good. And even while you're sitting there feeling the pain of a current space, you also feel the tug of God to go to a new place. And you got to make the decision whether well, you will honor the tug of God or you will hold on to where you've been. 
and God is no longer there for you. You have to make that decision. And no one else can make it for you. And just like Samuel, who when God said go, he was like, oh God, what if Saul finds out and try to kill me? God said, well, <laughs> tell him that you're going to worship. I know Saul or Samuel might have been like, man, that's like lying, right, God? <laughs> no, Samuel, because obedience is worship. How do you honor me? Do what I told you to do. That's how you honor me. And I don't know who I'm talking to even right now. But in this season, God is requiring you to leave the left place. And it's not that you're walking away into nothing. You're walking into your next assignment. That God has for you. And here's the next thing. Here's a deep thing. In your obedience and leaving the left place, you might discover that your next assignment ain't about the David you'll encounter. It's about the anointing you'll be doing. God has something profound not just waiting for you, but something profound to participate in. That's why you can't be afraid. And I know it's hard sometimes to leave the left place because the left place is what you've grown accustomed to. The left place is what you've learned to live in. But you got to get to a point in your life where you say, one, my obedience to God transcends my personal desire. And where my obedience to God is so real in my life that I'm willing to journey to the next assignment, even if I journey with a heavy heart and tear-filled eyes. I'm going to move when God says move. I'm going to go when and where God says go. And can I really blow your mind? There are no guarantees for you in the next assignment because the next assignment ain't even about you. So, so you got to have the courage and the confidence to move with no guarantees. And the only thing you know is that God requires your obedience in this next season. That's what God requires you to trust in this next season and your next move. And I've said this before, but when I was a little boy, and one thing I could always guarantee, Charles, is that when I got up in the mornings to come downstairs to go to the kitchen and get something to eat, that I would come down the stairs and I would have to walk past the living room and and in the living room was my grandmother on her knees. I mean, every day. Now, was she a perfect person? No. Because if y'all got some of them grandmoms, them big mama grandmoms, they... <laughs> but in spite of her own idiosyncrasies, every morning she was on her knees in that living room praying. And sometimes I would stand by the entrance of the living room and just watch her because... I thought it was amazing every day. And then she would leave the living room, walk through the dining room, go into the kitchen, and then she would start doing breakfast. For me, usually I was the first one. I was the only kid in the house, so I was the first one up getting ready to go to school, and she would do breakfast. And then every now and again, not every now and again, all the time, she would either be singing some hymn, humming some hymn, singing some, I ain't know. And I, and I, and I, and I learned a lot of hymns listen to my grandmother in that kitchen. But it wasn't until I had to learn obedience that there was one hymn that jumped out at me. On that day, I had to learn obedience. In fact, 
That day was this past Monday, 29 years, October 29th, where I had to learn to say yes to God and go with God. And that song she was singing, Cherry Ann, was this, where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Here's the part. And I'll go with him, with him, all the way. Where he leads me, I will follow. Come on. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him, all. Oh. Come on, y'all know that song. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Yeah. I'll go with him, with him all. Come on, say that one more time, child. Come on, it's simple. Where he leads, where he leads, me I will follow. Yes. Where he leads, me I will follow. Where he leads, where he leads. I will follow. Come on, tell somebody. And I'll, I'll go with hey, him. Hey, hey. With him. With him. Oh. oh yeah. The way. Yeah. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. And I'll, I'll go with him, with him. Stand on your feet. Keep playing that, Donna. Where he lead? We'll go safely through the garden. Go ahead, Doc. We'll go safely through the garden. Hey! We'll go safely through the garden. I'll go with him. Oh, all the way yeah. where he leads me, I will follow. Yeah. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads. Doors of church are open. Maybe somebody here today has in hand your own transformative encounter with God. Maybe God is calling you even closer now. Maybe you know God, but you don't have a church home. Maybe God is saying, 
follow me right now. Follow me right now. And if you feel the pull of God on your life saying that this is the place you ought to be, I want you to step out on faith today. And just follow God all the way. If you're upstairs, we'll wait for you. If you're in the back, we'll wait for you. But if you feel God saying go, you let God know that you'll follow today. And then lastly, you may be here today. And you know that you've been lingering in the left place too long. I know it's first Sunday, we got to get to communion, but if that's you today, you've been lingering in a left place too long. I want you to come now. We're going to go to God today. Come on, we're going to go to God today. standing just join somebody's hand thank you today we're so grateful oh God that you are so mindful of us at every step of the way you remind us that you have not forsaken us every step of the way oh God even in our faults and our flaws you still are mindful of us God there's some of us right now who are afraid of separation anxiety. So we've been lingering in some left places far too long, but God, give us the courage and the confidence to move forward, oh God, but knowing this, that we're moving forward under your direction, under your directive, and under your providential care, that you have us, God. You have us. We can rest assured that we may not know what will be in ahead of us but we know who will be beside us you will walk with us every step of the way remind us that we belong to you we love you God oh we love you God we are thankful today that unlike some other people in our lives you actually love us back and for that we say thank you this is our prayer in your name we pray oh God your children who've been redeemed by you. We say amen, amen, amen. Now come on and give somebody a hug. Come that you love them. Yes, Lord. Yeah. Come on, say now. I'll say yes. I'll say yes. Hey.
joining FCVC, at the opening of the doors, we had two to join. Linda Darby and Anika Payne. That's the bodyguard right there. So he, listen, we thank God for each and every one of you and both of you. And we thank God for your presence. We thank God for you, my man, for just being here and standing tall in this space. And so we honor that God has thought enough of us to allow you all to become part of this family. Amen. 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 Come on, extend those hands, FCBC. Thank you, Lord. Two more souls. Thank you, Lord. For two more soldiers. Thank you, Lord. For two more warriors. Thank you, Lord. For two more family members. Come on, put your hands together and give the Lord a hand clap of praise.